It's a pleasure to welcome you to this conference on the make or break decade. A make or break decade for climate action. And indeed, the next 10 years must be a turning point. First and foremost for global CO2 emissions. Today, global emissions are still rising and this has to change as a matter of urgency. Europe has decided to cut emissions by at least 55% already in the coming decade. This is to do our part and to show the way. We must act now before it's too late. The EIB is redefining the role of a multilateral development bank becoming Europe's climate bank. And you are showing the way forward for the critical decade. And I must say, I'm really proud of that. I have little doubt that Europe can and will manage this transition and achieve its goal of net zero by 2050, even if that still requires a lot of hard work. Europe's Green Deal tackles the crisis head on. It is ambitious, it is comprehensive, and like the transition in Central and Eastern Europe 30 years ago, it has strong focus on growth. With the next generation EU recovery package, reinforcements to the EU budget and the EIB by its side, Europe's Green Deal is also backed by an unprecedented public financial firepower. Not only must we make our fossil-based economies carbon neutral by 2050 to prevent catastrophic climate change, but we must do so while recovering from a public health and economic crisis. After the financial crisis, after the euro crisis, after Brexit, Europe now is leading the way on the climate front. This makes me a very proud European today. We now have a unique opportunity to transform our economies and to build back greener. This is one of the main aims of our recovery package. When the European Investment Bank announced it would stop financing fossil fuels, it raised the bar including for Washington. Here in the U.S., President Biden has committed to ending fossil fuel subsidies. We've also taken big strides in phasing out coal, thanks largely to local efforts that Bloomberg Philanthropies is glad to support. But of course, we can and we must do more to finance climate action all around the world. The EIB has been a front runner in excluding fossil fuel from its lending policy. That should ensure that ending fossil fuel finance and increasing support for adaptation becomes the international norm. EU can show leadership with its taxonomy and approach to just transition. We need to be careful to make sure this is not undermined by the gas issue. La solution est assez simple. On devrait chaque année consommer 5% en moins d'énergie fossile. Est-ce qu'il est possible de décarboniser nos vies? C'est la chose la plus facile à faire. Et pourtant, ça va toucher notre économie, donc personne n'a envie de le faire. On a chacun une responsabilité. On a tous peur de la mort, on veut tous avoir une meilleure vie pour nos enfants. Voilà, de toute façon, on a tous la mission et le devoir de continuer d'essayer de changer le monde. The spirit of Paris is really on the table because uh, Paris is supposed uh, to, uh, in each five years, to be more ambitious. And it's really what the, Europe, the European Union is making. We do uh, salute the United States to come back uh, to the Paris Agreement. It's really important, but the European Union don't want to lose the leadership in this process. We're doing the right thing in terms of changing our regulation, creating the incentives or even the obligation to do the transformation of the economy that we need. We, we cannot promise it will succeed. What we are promising is that we are putting in place all the instruments that we need, and they ought to work. I don't think in Europe that there's any issue about the sort of big building blocks of how to decarbonize the society. Um, where I think we're falling short and what we also hear from our members and say is that there needs to be a much stronger emphasis on creating decent jobs and strengthening social protection. That was uh, initiated by EU back two years ago. Again, they approached us in China and we're now working together on creating a working group on taxonomy, uh, which will produce a common ground taxonomy based on the uh, Chinese green standards and the European uh, sustainable finance taxonomy. That kind of common ground taxonomy will able to facilitate 
uh, smoother and lower cost cross-border transactions in the green space. I think the key point is, is uh, Jan Artis Butrand asked us the question, what, you know, what, what can I do? What can each of us do? But at the end of the day, it's also for each organization, each business, each company, each institution to also ask itself what it can do and to adapt its strategy accordingly. We have to continue to, to persuade people that, that, that really today with the technologies that we have, uh, that there is no, no trade-off between having economic growth and also having a, an environmental sustainability. Today's decisions matter because the suffering is already happening. And while climate change may appear as a distant threat to the people living in the EU, I have witnessed the impacts at first hand. From the droughts and acute water shortages affecting over 200,000 people in my country, the famines and food insecurity, desert locusts, invasion, floods, and even heat waves. Investing in nature-based solutions will awaken our imaginations in ways that emissions reductions are not able to. This is about the food we eat, the forests we walk into, and the bad songs that we get to enjoy. I am particularly grateful to Elizabeth for her inspiring words. It is by hearing young leaders like her that I feel confident that we will in the end prevail in building a sustainable and inclusive future for all. But we cannot leave it to the younger generations only to take action. Actually, we need all to do our part and act now. As Commissioner for Financial Services, I want to support the revolution in sustainable investment. The EIB, as the Climate Bank of the European Union, is helping to show the way forward. Our citizens expect great change, especially our young people, as we've seen over the past number of years with school strikes and protests. Indeed, the European Parliament has rightly called the situation what it is, a climate emergency. In the European Union, we want to provide a comprehensive framework for sustainable investment as a key part of the European Green Deal. We will provide the tools and incentives to channel the demand for sustainable investment in the right direction, to help companies and investors know what is green, to avoid greenwashing and enable the transition towards sustainability. I look forward to working with all our partners, the other EU institutions, the EIB, the private sector, to make the European Green Deal a reality. Innovation, as we know it, is not homogeneous. Breaking through technologies are rather a mixture of brilliant ideas, hard work and well-tailored finance, oftentimes squared with the entrepreneurial spirit and luck. We are really at the critical moment in history to catalyze the Green Revolution. But Green Revolution will not succeed without innovation. I firmly believe that with properly designed financial architecture along the two lines I've just mentioned, we can spur the new wave of innovative projects with the potential to move the world two or even three steps to full climate neutrality. Smart, aggressive climate action will drive new technologies, will improve economic efficiency and will lower risks. And combined, those can lead to gains of $26 trillion, the new Climate Economy Commission has told us. But in addition, we've learned that it's no longer about incremental change. It's not about individual projects. It's about system change. It's not silver bullets. It's a jigsaw puzzle. The Paris Agreement being one very important turning point yes. where the private sector, where investors now felt that governments around the world had committed to, uh, get, to get to net zero by 2050 and that they then had a bit more certainty. I mean, I mean, there's more certainty needed, but they knew where things were going. And then within the same year, we also had the sustainable development goals. Again, that governments around the world had signed off on and committed to. And this was a real impetus, impetus in the market that, I de that we've definitely seen. The pandemic has certainly put, uh, put a different uh, gear, if you like, uh, into, into the sustainable finance. And of course, what we saw last year is that, whereas we had been previously very, very focused on environment and even within environment on climate, we are now looking wider. We are looking at things also from the social uh, uh, point of view, and we are seeing how all this actually 
belongs together. You don't, you can't see environment without social, vice versa. Pandemics has got a, a very close link to the environmental factors and so on. The first act of the uh, current commission was to promote a, a Green New Deal that uh, we pushed in uh, 2019. So mm -hmm. before uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we had already tried to operate on other aspects to um, improve, uh, for example, information disclosure in the financial sector. Uh, we had been working on the taxonomy, which was actually the regulation was approved at the end of the 2019, and now we are now working on uh, the uh, delegated acts to really make it fully uh, uh, operational. So, and, and this, of course are the results of long processes and long political debates. The financial markets, as we've seen in the last 20 years, haven't done a particularly great job uh, to support social or other issues, and now we are ahead. Um, so what we really need is a public-private partnership in the sense that we talk, and thank you for inviting me today. I think I'm the only private sector representative today. <laughs> You're very welcome. And the We're pleased to have you. <laughs> we need the action that we've heard before which is, uh, yes, uh, things are complicated, but our children have too. They are sick and tired to, uh, to wait and hear answers, both from business and politics. It's complicated. It takes too long. They have no time. We're right. killing the planet. So you need to speed up. Need a sense of direction. This is very important. Then we need to create these framework conditions. So, so we need to have clarity on the labeling, on the, on the taxonomy, on the risk reporting. And, and that allows then uh, the private sector to, to, to do the investment in the right, right direction. And then on top of that, uh, we, we, we need also public, uh, public investments, but also public reforms in, in, in or reforms of, of the uh, sectoral reform to make the economy greener. All right. Now, what better way to round up this session than to hear Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank. Here she is. So it is essential to support and drive an orderly transition to a green economy. The primary responsibility for that action lies with government, who control the most important tools. But it will require effort and commitment from all parts of society, including central banks. And while there is a long road ahead, I believe the necessary steps are clear and progress has already begun. But the transition itself requires substantial rates of green innovation and investment. The green bond market has expanded substantially since the EIB itself issued the first climate awareness bond in 2007. Bravo! The EU commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and cut its emissions by at least 55% by 2030, as well as the European Green New Deal have contributed to a global momentum that is irreversible. Similarly, the European Investment Bank has set a gold standard in aligning its lending portfolio and policies with the Paris Agreement. We look forward to other multilateral development banks and development finance institutions following suit. The good news is that making the investments necessary to reach net zero actually unlock this unprecedented opportunity in job creation. Two of the three fastest growing jobs here in the United States right now are in renewable energy. And 75% of the new energy that came online in the last couple of years came from renewable energy, not from fossil fuels. We're closing our coal plants, not opening new ones. And we're certainly not funding any other new ones around the world, as I know the EIB has joined in and refuses to do. So the climate conference in Glasgow in November is gonna be the key milestone of this decade long sprint. The United States will come to Glasgow with an ambitious new commitment, a revised nationally determined contribution, which we will announce at our summit uh, in April 22nd, if not slightly before. Even though we're not a EIB shareholder, uh, I would uh, commend you for the commitment of raising your climate ambition and your pioneering work on green bond development, your leadership in phasing out the financing of fossil fuel. All of these things matter because they represent the kind of uh, behavior that we need from institutions all across the planet. And you've set a standard that banks everywhere can strive to meet. The EIB uh, obviously is gonna be part of the financial backbone of the European Green Deal. And that is going to challenge a, a trillion pounds, a, a euros at least, 
to climate efforts across Europe. I'm delighted to bring in and introduce Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF, Werner Hoyer, President of the European Investment Bank, and Achim Steiner, who is the Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. It is so encouraging, gives you such a good feeling to see the United States back on stage on this very, very important topic. And I believe that with the support of the United States and the close cooperation between the European Union and the United States, we can make a difference. We need solidarity and camaraderie. My institution, the IMF, comes squarely, as does yours, as does Akin's, uh, in making sure that we play to our advantage so the world moves faster to a point of sustainability. But let's also recognize that just transitions can be intensely local and national and international. And I think at this moment uh, in time, these are both playing out. Inside countries, within societies, there are real dilemmas about communities, about economies, about uh, infrastructure that exists. And these need to be resolved very rapidly because otherwise the imperative to act becomes very difficult to act upon. We are at such a pivotal time when the IMF has a huge role to play. First and foremost, helping countries shape up policies that will underpin the transition. Developing countries obviously need help in order to leapfrog polluting development. It is now necessary to bring clean technologies to the developing world quickly. How can we achieve that and how can we speed up the process at a time when we must stop thinking innovation, climate and development separately. Technology is one piece. There is also innovation in policy. And for us at the fund, this is now central. We are now seeing a very different narrative emerge in financial markets, stranded assets, but also opportunities. Climate change is becoming the opportunity of the century. Lord Nicholas Stern has said it, you heard John Kerry speak to it, but also Oliver Bette and others. This is the future of an um, economic investment economy across the globe. I'm delighted to introduce Franz Timmermans, Executive Vice President of the European Commission, and Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In my view, 2021 and concretely COP26 offers us an opportunity to launch a great human project, a human project to emerge from this global tragedy towards a transformation that will lead us to a better, healthier, more prosperous future for all. We need to get cracking now. We need to set it in motion now. It is possible. We have the money. We have the technology. Of course, we need to develop it further. But in principle, it's all there. What we need is the political will and the understanding that this is a global challenge we need to face now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.